Good morning, friends. Steve from Southern Illinois. And yes, I'm outside again today. It's a balmy 29 degrees. For those of you in Celsius territory, that translates to minus two. But I just wanted you to see the beauty that, that is out here today, okay? Um, yeah, I'm not sure you're really going to be able to see it, but that glistening stuff behind me is ice coating the branches. We had an ice storm two days ago, uh, which means that the air above us was warm enough to keep the rain liquid as it fell, but there was a layer of cold air right down here on the ground that froze things as it came down. So we have ice coating the branches and dripping down in icicles. It's magical. Unless you have to walk or drive, in which case it's slick as can be. So, the prophetic message that uh, is found in Revelation for Christians today, the message to the Laodiceans, is this. You think you're hot, but you're not. So far we've examined two spiritual thermometers that we can use for measuring our temperature as Christians, our love for each other, and our unity. Today we are standing by as a global community watching just how horrible things can be get when we value power, economics, social standing, security, or even truth more than love and unity. Over 45 million of us today are standing in the crossfire as opponents battle it out in the Ukraine. <coughs> but that brings up a question that one of you messaged me after my talk last week. Aren't we Christians called to defend the truth against false doctrines? How can we value unity more than that? It's a good question, and it's one that I was already struggling with because I'm not here just spouting off something that I've been taught. I'm learning with you as we're going through this. Reminds me of a story, though. Okay, I was in my early 20s. Vivian and I had just returned from a year of, of missionary work in Indonesia. We were energized, enthusiastic Christians on fire for the Lord. If anything, we were hot. Okay, we ended up in California and it didn't take long for our enthusiasm to catch the attention of the leaders of the local church. And soon we were asked to coordinate the collegiate uh, ministries for the church. But then a controversy swept through our denomination. Church leaders were being accused of fraud and deception. The basic teachings were being debated. The young adults in the church, the collegiate, collegiate members, were concerned about this. They wanted to know if these allegations were true. They wanted to examine the evidence for themselves. They wanted to talk about this and, and learn about this. But the local church leadership made the decision that there would be no discussion, no examination, no response of any sort. Well, that didn't sit well with the young adults or with me as their leadership. I, I asked to speak directly to the senior pastors and the church board about the decision, but my request was denied. And in my <coughs> immaturity, the next Sabbath I reported back to the young adults and I minced no words about what was going on. By Wednesday I was notified that my leadership position had been terminated and the following week after I spoke up in in Sabbath school I got a message that I was not to participate in any further discussions in Sabbath school 
and if I did, my membership would be dropped and a restraining order would be, be taken out on me uh, so that I could be removed from the premises by force if necessary. I had gone from being the golden boy to being the black sheep overnight. To say that this was a crushing blow to me would be putting it mildly. I mean, this was not just my ego. It struck deeply to my spiritual core. All I wanted was for dialogue to occur so that the young people, so that I could examine the issues. If truth is truth, it can bear examination. And if the church leadership was objecting to that examination, wasn't wasn't that just a tacit admission that something was amiss? Well, I continued to attend church there in silence, but my heart was crying. And the angst I was feeling leaked out in the form of a song. And after listening to it, the youth pastor allowed me to sing it as a special music in Sabbath school. He later got disciplined for this, but he took the risk. After church that day, one of the older members walked up to me. Ray Foster had been a missionary too. He was he had a head full, full of gray hair, and he was known as a conservative of conservatives among the conservative um, part, portion of the church. And yet, he always attended the collegiate Sabbath school instead of going to the adult classes. When we asked him why, he said, you're the future of the church. I'm here to support you. I believe in you. But he rarely spoke up. He refused any leadership role. He was there as a passive supporter. But as he approached me that Sabbath, <laughs> I wasn't sure that he believed in me. I wasn't sure I believed in me. And so I looked at him kind of apprehensively Would you like to come to our home today for dinner? He asked. I was stunned. He had never spoken directly to me. I mean, I was a leader, but he didn't, he was not active. He didn't push himself forward. And I was under discipline from the church. What was he thinking coming and talking to me? And yet here he was inviting me home for dinner. And over a lump in my throat, I choked out, yes. Well, that became a regular routine. Vivian and I were invited home to, 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 home to, the, to have dinner with them every Sabbath that we were both in church. And when we got there, we were involved by the family. We were setting the table, putting the food out. We were a part of them. And after the meal was over, Ray would take me out on the deck. He was an introvert. He still didn't say much. And I was uncertain and wounded. And I'm terrible at small talk anyhow. So we would sit out there on the deck, looking out over the valley, and not saying much at all. We just ate, and then went out and sat in silence. And I knew that I was loved. We never discussed religion. We never discussed the controversy, my discipline. We didn't discuss anything but I knew that I belonged. Now, a few months later, Vivian and I started attending a neighboring church where the young adults were being allowed to examine issues, but my boat was still rocking. It took me 10 years to find spiritual stability. That wasn't the only factor, but my exclusion from the church was a major blow to my spiritual foundations. 
Through it all, though, I never forgot Ray Foster's generosity in inviting us home when all others were excluding me. It became one of my anchors, the symbols that kept hope and faith alive as I was assailed by cynicism and agnosticism. How do humans deal with it when unity breaks down? Well, this is just Steve's analysis, but I see four basic patterns. One, we start talking, okay? Now, ideally, this is dialogue. Dialogue means that we are talking with mutual respect, listening to each other's viewpoints, with compassion and empathy, identifying with each other's emotions, pains, fears, and generosity. The three disciplines that I've proposed are really the core of what love is. When any of these three are abandoned, the conversation moves from dialogue to debate, argument, the struggle to prove ourselves right and our opponents wrong. All of us have experienced this in our personal relationships. Okay? What starts out as a dialogue falls apart. We start arguing, we start fighting. And when we can't convince each other, the second response that we have is the use of peer pressure. We still use words, but now we're adding ridicule, appeal to the opinions of others, using the threat of exclusion to manipulate the other person into acquiescing to our point of view. Manipulation is the key to peer pressure. We're no longer trying to convince, we're trying to control. And many times people just skip dialogue and jump directly to peer pressure because their goal is not unity, but being right. If that doesn't work, there's always politics, okay? Politics shifts the focus from the individual to the public, the group, from convincing people to controlling the behavior and thoughts of large groups. There are very few democracies in the world where everyone participates in the decision-making. You can't have more than about 200 people in a true democracy. In most countries and organizations, an individual or groups of individuals have the power, and the rest of us have little say. In democracy, politics involves convincing individuals in all of the rest of the work, the systems, all you have to do is convince the leaders, the people in power, and then they use incentives or the threat of violence or exclusion or firing to control the behavior of everyone else. What all of these systems have in common, though, is that the decision, once the decision makers are convinced, everyone else has to follow suit or pay a price. Even those of us who live in democratic countries have experienced this to a degree as we've navigated the COVID pandemic. Okay. And finally, when politics doesn't achieve our goals, we always have the final resort of going to war which is what is happening today in the Ukraine. The unabashed use of power to harm or destroy our opponents and force the illusion of unity by eliminating the dissidents. It happens at the international level, it happens at the family level, it happens at the church level. The same patterns that I observe in the world happen 
in Christian circles when we disagree. Now, what Ray Foster taught me was that love is not an emotion, it's an action. Even in my confusion, and I have to admit, I was wrong. But even in my confusion and my anger, he extended respect to me. He believed that I would find my way through the storm that I was in. He believed it so strongly that he never once tried to correct me or guide me or teach me. Years later, I asked him why, and he said, you never asked. Besides, I was praying for you. I knew that God was more than willing and more than able to do all of those things for you. And God did. Ray engaged me with compassion, not the melodramatic, huggy tuggy, you know, warm and cuddly type of compassion you see in the movies or the, the, that's promoted in the fundraising drive for the starving children. No, not that kind of compassion. His compassion was much more practical and direct. He knew I was in pain, the pain of exclusion. And he addressed my pain directly by inviting me into his home and treating me as though I belonged there. There was no compromise with truth. There was no confrontation, no convincing. I belonged, and that was all there was to it. Ray acted so generously. It took major courage for him to include me. He never told me if he suffered any backlash from the rest of the church, but it really didn't matter because I recognized the generosity of his actions, and he never asked for anything in return, ever. His respect, his compassion were given freely. From Ray, I learned that harmony, unity is possible with someone with whom we disagree, vehemently, but only if the radical love that Jesus had for his disciples is already in our hearts. That is my prayer for you today, my friends. This world needs Jesus, not in some mystical sense, but in the lives of his disciples, in the love that they have for each other and for their enemies. Because when you love your enemies, unity is possible. When you have respect, when you choose to give respect, when you choose to have compassion, and when you do it with generosity, unity is the result. Be safe, my friends. Be prudent. But above all, keep looking up. I'll see you. I may not see you next week. I have to do some education over the next week, and that's going to involve some travel. But I enjoy our times together, so I may be talking to you from elsewhere, but we'll just have to wait and see.